uh, thank you guys for having me today. It's so nice to be able to come to speak with you. When I was first in, uh, when I was in college, I loved when speakers would come talk to us, like people working in the field would come speak to my class or our classes because it gave me a really good idea of what jobs I might actually be having or what type of work I might be doing post-grad. So thank you for having me. And uh, yeah, listen to Shao, she's a great designer. I don't do much with design. I almost everything is filmmaking. And so I'm excited to be able to tell you guys a little bit about that today. Um, so first I'll say buenos dias from Colombia. Right now I'm in Colombia, uh, desperately trying to learn Spanish. Um, but, uh, but it's about the same time here. There's only a one hour time difference. So it's about the same time for me, just as early for me as it is for you guys. So I'll first give you a description of kind of like my path and how I became a filmmaker. It's sort of an unorthodox path. When I first, uh, when I was in high school, my sophomore year of high school, I did a study abroad year in Denmark. So I lived in Denmark for a year. And the reason that's un unorthodox is because mostly people will do that their senior year, but I did it when I was 15. And one of the things I noticed about Danish school is their high school is really similar to like an American college where they have like four to six hours of class and it's spread throughout the day and it's not just an eight hour full schedule. Um, and so when I came back to the US and I went to high school there, uh, I, I wasn't like the a structure of high school. And because I had seen something that was similar to college, I ended up getting my GED and leaving high school when I was 16. So I was totally done with my high school experience when I was 16. Uh, and then I enrolled, and so this was my study abroad. Uh, by the way, it was such a great experience. It gave me a passion for travel and uh, a, pa a little bit of a passion for like taking pictures and video, but mostly my study abroad just gave me uh, a bit of an education in, in world history and uh, a love for travel. So after that, I got my GED when I was 16 and I enrolled in community college and I did two years at community college. And one of the most important things I wanna say about my time at community college is I had no idea what I wanted to study or what I wanted to do while I was in community college. I just focused on gen ed requirements. Um, but by the time I was near the end of those two years, I had an idea of what I wanted to study even though I didn't know what I wanted to do. And that turned out to be business or advertising management. Um, so I went to business school at Michigan State uh, for advertising management. And college for me was a really, really good uh, opportunity to learn about a bunch of different fields. And that's exactly what I did. I got a, a bunch of small internships in different fields to get an idea of what I might be doing post-grad. The first internship I had was at a public relations firm called Truscott Rossman. And I was basically like a front desk assistant there. And I also got to do some PR stuff like writing press releases and making media lists. And that was a really important experience for me, but it gave me this impression that firms were worked really hard, like they had long hours and sort of an intense work environment. Um, but it was a really good experience for me. At this time, I thought I wanted to do either corporate marketing or public relations. Um, so this is way before I was really aware that I wanted to do filmmaking. Then the next internship I had was a corporate marketing internship. And that would turn out to be the most like the first full-time job I got. Um, and uh, yeah, that I learned a lot from that too. One thing I figured from my corporate marketing experience was that they had good work-life balance. And so that kind of uh, made me want to go corporate route instead of firm when I was first uh, graduating. But that was a really good experience and I learned a lot from that experience as well. Um, the last internship I had in college was a videography internship. So this is me just becoming, starting to become aware that I might be interested in video. I tried this one internship and I got to get some of my first ever projects out. And so that was a really good experience for me as well. So I didn't always know I wanted to be a filmmaker. I really didn't know I wanted to be a filmmaker. Even college, all four years of my college experience were me still kind of trying to feel out whether what field I wanted to do. Um, and that's why I think college was such a good experience for me trying different things. Um, but I wasn't, I don't have pictures of me with a camera when I was five years old. 
Uh, this wasn't something that I knew from a really young age. It was something I discovered a lot later uh, in life, I would say. And the one experience that really impacted me that caused me to want to uh, do filmmaking was six months of travel after I graduated. So when I graduated college, I took six months off to travel the world. And that was such a great experience. Um, so I went to 13 countries. This is before COVID. But that's not to say that you can't do it, you know, during COVID, because now I'm in Colombia. And I just spent uh, the last three or four months in Central America and Costa Rica and Guatemala. And so travel is still very much a possibility today. And when I was doing that travel, I started a YouTube channel and I made 50 videos. Nobody watched them, but it was just me starting to become interested in filmmaking, um, just practicing, putting as much content out there as I could. So that trip really helped me define my passion, which was filmmaking. And it was one of the most edu important educational experiences of my life. So I want to urge all of you guys to try to take some opportunity to travel, whether it's through study abroad in college or right when you graduate. It's a great time to do it. When I did my study abroad in Denmark, most Danish people take a gap year, one year off in between high school and college or college in their first full time job. And that culture really resonated with me. And that's why I took some time to travel after college. So I really want to encourage you guys to do that if you have an opportunity to travel. So then I got back from that six months of travel and I started my first full time job at Ford. Uh, so I moved out to Houston, Texas to work as a zone manager for Ford. And I knew almost immediately that like corporate sales and marketing wasn't for me. Um, and I had a, a couple misconceptions about it, too, because I had done the firm internship and the corporate marketing internship. And so I thought the firm were more intense and the corporate marketing corporations were more like had more work life balance. But that wasn't my experience when I got there. Um, but it was still such an important experience for me to develop my skills. It was great training and it turned out to be really important because I needed to save money to invest in equipment to start my own videography career and start doing filmmaking full time. So at the beginning of 2020, I quit my full-time job and I started filmmaking full-time. And so when I did that, I got my LLC and I started investing in camera equipment with the money I had earned from that first full-time job, which when I came off the six months of travel, I did not have any money. So I did need to work for a while to save money in order to buy the equipment that I needed to start filmmaking. So I worked for free for two months before I got my first paying client. And I literally worked eight to 10 hours a day, every day, uh, just doing free work. Whether that was me contacting local businesses, seeing if they needed videography help, me just doing practice videos. I remember I made like a documentary about my, my family's history where I like use photos from the past hundred years. And I just got work in it everywhere I could. I did a lot of free work during that time. And it was actually my last free uh, project that I did where the guy said, that was really good. I'm gonna pay you for it. And, and by the way, can you come back next week and do the same job for me and I'll pay you weekly. And so that turned out to be my first paying client which was a church. And so, yeah, so, you know, a lot of people have to have this time where they work uh, for free and that's totally a part of your development. And I needed a lot of hard skills at the time too. I needed to learn how to use lighting, uh, how to shoot in 4K, all of that. So after that, after I started to get a, a little bit of business, I created a contract, I developed prices, made a logo, website and business cards. And I won't say that every, you don't have to do all of that in order to get business in the beginning. But as you start your career, I think that is usually what that's the, you know, the way that you need to start getting new business um, for developing prices. Like I learned all of this um, kind of like last minute. It was like I started doing hourly prices, but then I learned that that can be abused because you're constantly reporting hours and the client wants you to make, you know, bring down your hours. And so I started to do half day, full day rates. And so I learned so much in that first year about how to make my prices and how to get business, which I also learned is, is so much based on referrals. 
So doing good work for the clients that you do have helps you get more work. Um, and then the last piece of that puzzle for that year was getting my FAA drone pilot license. So you can fly drones as a hobbyist. Um, you know, there's nothing illegal about that. But if you want to make money commercially with your drone, you have to get a FAA license. So I tested for that and got the drone license. And that really uh, expanded my career even further and was an important piece. Um, because I think if you want to be a filmmaker today, um, learning how to use drones is a, can be an important piece of the puzzle. I was really happy to get a job with Selena. And I'll kind of explain from a, first from a business perspective of how I got that work. So like when it comes to acquiring the client, I first needed to find out which businesses in my area had a need for video. So the first thing I did when I got to this city in Costa Rica is I started to look up, you know, small businesses in the area that needed video and to see if they had any content already on their social media website or anything like that. Uh, then I identified, identified three that I wanted to go speak to. I went to speak to them. I left a business card and I showed them my portfolio of work with my laptop, just showed them some of my work. And then Selena was the first business to contact me back in La Fortuna. So I came to meet with the manager and talk to him about what kind of video would actually be useful for them. And if there was anything that I could do to add value. The manager was super happy with my work and he wanted to, you know, uh, create a project with me. And so we talked about that and I came back again with a contract. We signed the contract to discuss pricing and like establish the due date. And right at that time is when I established him, that manager, as the single point of contact. So if you're an independent filmmaker, one of the most important things that I've noticed is that you'll be working with a manager and a team of people usually. And so what I'll try to do is establish one person who I talk to, who I'll get all the feedback from, and then his team will compile all of their you know, revision information and give it to the manager. And then the manager and I are the only people who talk. And so managing expectations is super important, letting them know how many revisions you're willing to do uh, and collecting a deposit, which is usually half the project's cost upfront. Um, yeah, so all of those are just the business side before I even began to work on the project. So from a commercial work uh, perspective for the production, so how to, after I've already secured the business, now how do I go about producing it? Uh, so the first thing I started to think about for this hostel were what were the hostel's USPs or unique selling propositions. So for this hostel, they really had a lot of great events like yoga, salsa class, activities in nature. And so I, uh, so I, those were the USPs that I wanted to highlight for this business. And so I made sure to include all of those in the video, everything that the manager and I talked about. Um, the other thing I had to think about is the format, like where is this video actually going to appear, whether it's going to be on YouTube, a website, social media. If it's social media, I need to format it differently for a phone screen. If it's YouTube, it needs to be full screen like you're seeing now, 16 by 9. Um, and the unique thing for this business was that they actually played these travel videos in the business on a couple different TV screens in the hostel. Um, so because of that, I knew I actually had to to do something without speaking, that it had to just be, you know, beautiful imagery and B-roll with good music, because I knew that the, the main viewer was not going to be able to hear the words being spoken. And so that's what we ended up doing for this project. It was totally audio uh, with music only, no voiceover. Um, and then at the end of that, we had to, you know, I'll do revisions, send, send everything to the manager. He'll look over it, give me his revisions, and then also withholding the project until you receive payment, which is a super important piece too. Uh, what I'll usually do is I'll put the word draft in like 50% opacity in the video so they can view the whole thing, but they won't be able to download that copy and keep it. Um, so I'll send it to them with the word draft into it, and then I'll get payment, and then I'll send the full project. Um, and so those are all things that I do to protect myself and protect them. Um, so for the second case study is a music video from an artist, Jackie Baldori. I have lost my 
myself somehow Always feeling inside out I'm just trying to find my way Got my head spinning round Topsy-turvy upside down I just want to get my Myself somehow, always feeling inside out. So uh, if you notice there about the how I shot with the drone, you know, drone footage is great for establishing establishing a shot and giving you an idea of where the artist is, but you just use it intermittently so that I'm not using too much drone. Um, but yeah, so that was a really fun project that I got to work on. And many freelancers get their start with music videos. So it's a really uh, important way to first get work as a videographer. So if uh, if you reach out to local musicians and offer to either do one for free or for like five hundred dollars, a lot of musicians would love to have you help them produce something. Um, so the first thing I did for this project is just gather information from the artist, and in this case, the artist manager. And so I use that information to help create a proposal and a quote. Um, then I'll define a timeline, and it's usually centered around an album release or a single release. Um, I'll storyboard with the artist. In this case, she had a really interesting idea. She asked if I could film her while she was on the bike singing. And she asked me if I wanted to like hook a GoPro up to the bike. And I remember thinking, yeah, I think we can do that. But what I'll do is I'll just have the drone in front of her and I'll back it up as she bikes forward. And so that's how we ended up getting this shot um, just through having the drone follow her as she biked down the street singing. Um, and so it's really cool. She, the artist had a lot of really interesting ideas of what she wanted to make happen in the video. I had some cool ideas. And so you have to make sure your vision aligns because you are the director. If you're an independent filmmaker, you don't have a whole team of people here to help ideate. And it's you and the artist whose job it is to come up with kind of the structure and the story of the video. And that even comes down to the shooting locations. So for, I, I know Detroit really well, so I, I could recommend some good shooting locations, places that had big, beautiful murals. And so that's what I did. I recommended five shooting locations and then she selected those three. 
And so, like I said, you're the director if you're going to shoot a music video. Uh, and so you need to be able to offer suggestions and help them storyboard the whole project. All right, so case study three was a documentary I shot for a coffee farmer in Costa Rica. This was a really cool project. Um, the way I started and the way I start all of my, you know, documentary production is with a ton of research. So I'll do a lot of research about the interviewee's particular field and get to know a lot. That way I can craft compelling questions and come ready with some really well-versed questions. But at the same time, I have to be ready. Um, but at the same time, I have to be ready to adjust on the fly. And if something comes up that while well, I'm doing the interview and I wanna change how I do the interview, um, I'll do that. And so right now I'll share that project with you guys. Okay, so this is a project I did for Chris in Costa Rica um, about his coffee farm. My plan was not to be a, a hippie farmer. My plan was to be a Spanish teacher, but I can produce education with coffee, the most popular drink in the planet. Welcome to the Ecological Sanctuary. My name is Chris, and this is my coffee dream. I started when I was 16 years old, not because I wanted it, because she pushed me. That's why you will see my mom moving around, uh, planting new geisha varieties. But well, now I love coffee. So the last nine years I've been harvesting the coffee. Basically in the middle of the cloud forest, we showed the people that it's possible to grow organic coffee. The coffee is so important for us because we can produce environmental conscience. That's the main purpose. I think that coffee is my passion and my religion. And with this, I can show the customers the importance in the traceability of the, of the specialty coffee. And once they drink that cup, they will feel like here, in the middle of a plantation in Costa Rica, <laughs> right in the cloud forest. I think the most important thing about coffee is that shows me to appreciate the moment and the time the energy of every person involved in the traceability of the product. It makes me feel graceful and thankful that I have a chance every day to enjoy my cup of coffee. So that is the good thing about sustainable farming. We protect 115 acres of forest of the ecological sanctuary. We can get fruits, we can get lemons, and the food that we need. Basically, we don't go to the supermarket very often for food. We grow mostly of it. The good thing about the specialty coffee is that it is grows by small farmers. Big plantations cannot produce a specialty coffee. So when you are drinking this, you are supporting a family like mine. the project that I shot for the coffee farmer in Costa Rica. So yeah, preparing questions on the fly. The other thing I'll do as I begin to uh, ideate for a mini documentary or a documentary is to make a list of B-roll shots that I want to get. Um, and after I do the interview, I want to make sure I ask for supporting photos and additional B-roll. So for this guy, he mentioned how he got his start as a coffee farmer when he was, you know, 15, 16. And so I said, hey, do you have a picture of yourself from when you were that age that we can use? And so he sent me this photo of him at that time. And so uh, that's the only thing I want to be looking out for. After, as I'm shooting the interview, I'm also thinking, what additional things do I want to film to help support his message? Uh, and what other images or videos from his past could I use to strengthen and convey his messages in the documentary? Okay, so then after I get done with that, I'm gonna begin post-production. And so I begin the editing process. And the way I do that is I'll rewatch the whole interview um, a couple of times, usually three to four times, I'll rewatch the whole thing. I'll find a, th a song that matches the theme and then I'll begin like uh, grouping related moments of the interview to together. 
so that I can start to build the story. And what I'll usually look for is a hook or something compelling that I can bring to the front of the documentary. And so for this coffee guy, the hook that I brought forward was that he actually wanted to be a Spanish teacher before he became a coffee farmer and how his original path was to be a Spanish teacher. And so that was a really compelling hook, I thought. So I brought that right to the front before the intro. And then I went into his whole story after that. And so this is the time to be flexible with the story outline and maybe change things if they revealed, if the interviewee revealed a compelling message. Um, this is the time to kind of pull that to the front and kind of re redraft your story. Um, and, at, and as I'm editing too, I'm mixing in B-roll or footage that I shot to help convey the speaker's idea. And then lastly, I'll send that draft or I'll go physically watch the draft with the client or interviewee so I can get feedback and make adjustments, not only so that I can be you know, um, serving a client well, but also so I can just capture the story accurately because he might have some insider information uh, that will change the direction of my documentary a little bit.